and I, I thought I would talk a little bit about why I think this work is so important and give you a sense of where we are from a university perspective. Um, as Ian mentioned, strengthening our relationship with um, Charlottesville, the Alamo County and the surrounding counties has been a top priority of mine since I began as president and it's a key element in our strategic plan. And part of the motivation for this is just based on my observation and experience over 15 years uh, when I was on the law faculty. Um, I, I lived in the community. Uh, my wife Katie and I raised um, four kids and my sense was that the um, relationship between the university, Charlottesville, Albemarle County, Greene County, Louisa, um, uh, and the like, uh, was okay, but could be better. Um, and I thought that it was important when I began to focus on this as a topic, because in my view, our fates are linked together. That is, uh, the strength of the university depends in no small part on the strength of the region generally. Um, and there's a, there's a very simple and straightforward reason for this, which is that there is no clear separation between what you would call the UVA community and then the community outside of UVA, in large part because people who work at UVA live in the surrounding communities, um, which just brings home that um, we're completely connected. Um, I also take seriously the idea that we're an anchor institution. We're the largest employer in the region. And I think with that comes responsibilities um, to help create a community that um, is equitable, um, inclusive. Um, and in some ways, I, I've described this to people, the, the goal is that people who live in this region should think that UVA um, confers something of an unfair advantage to them uh, because of its presence. Um, and um, and that's, what, that's what motivates me. Um, this is also especially important, I think, for an educational institution. This is an opportunity for us um, to live our values and to show our students, not just tell them about what it means to be an equitable partner um, uh, to the community. So, that's what motivated the focus. Let me talk to you a little bit about um, what we've done and, and where we are. So in fall of 2018, when I started as president, we put together um, uh, President's Council on UVA Community Partnerships and brought together community leaders um, with faculty, staff, and uh, a student representative. And I asked them to do one thing and one thing only, which is identify the key issues facing the region um, that UVA could, um, could partner on. Um, having lived here for a long time, I sort of figured what would be on the list, uh, but I thought it was important not to come in as the new president and say, oh, I know exactly what this region needs and let me tell you um, what we're going to do. Uh, and that instead it would be much better if the community could talk with us um, and develop an agenda. And the four issues that they identified as, as top of the list are not that surprising. One is jobs and wages, another is affordable housing, a third is education, and a fourth is um, access to healthcare. And that was the only charge I gave them. I didn't ask them to then, then uh, solve those issues, which are all uh, naughty, as you know. But the group had coalesced um, so well um, that they had become like a large family um, and I couldn't bear to um, see them go. So I asked them to stay on for the next phase of the work, which involved identifying working groups on discrete issues within these larger categories, because the categories themselves are obviously pretty large. Just think about um, uh, education, for example. And so they focused on four areas. One is um, the local economy, which is focused uh, quite a bit on UVA's procurement practices and how we can um, bolster um, local businesses. Um, the second is on pipelines and pathways. Uh, so making it um, easier uh, for community members to find out about um, job opportunities and then to have a path, uh, uh, a pathway um, for um, uh, uh, developing while they're, um, while they're working here. A third is on early childhood education, uh, figuring out ways that we can work with local partners to create more opportunities for um, early childhood care, early childhood 
good education um, for kids from um, birth to um, five. And fourth is an affordable housing um, advisory group to um, address the pressing issue of affordable housing um, in, our, in our area. So uh, timing is everything. And we announced the working groups on March 10th uh, of last year. And for those of you who might remember, on March 11th of last year, the World Health Organization uh, declared that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. Uh, so like a lot of things that we were working on at that time, um, we had to put that uh, to one side while we focused on um, COVID. Uh, we have since restarted the groups uh, last month, um, and we've added a fifth group um, that will focus on um, access to healthcare with a particular focus on the social determinants of health. Um, even though we've had uh, fits and starts because of the pandemic, um, we have been able to make uh, some progress. In March of 2019, as you may recall, um, we announced that uh, we were increasing the minimum wage for full-time employees at UVA to $15 an hour. Um, we then worked with our major contractors to do the same for their employees. Um, we've set a goal of helping to develop 1,000 to 1,500 affordable housing units in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. Um, we created uh, and funded the Equity Center, uh, which is focused on, and I know um, someone from the Equity Center is on the panel, uh, focused on community-engaged scholarship. And um, we also opened the Center for Community Partnerships, uh, which is a place for those in the community to um, collaborate with uh, those at the UVA who are working on community projects. And it is where um, folks from the Equity Center have set up their shop. Um, and then just recently, you probably saw the news that um, the health system um, revised its billing and collections practices um, to remove all liens and judgments um, for those uh, patients who are at 400% of the poverty level or below and have $50,000 in assets or below, not including, uh, uh, not including uh, their homes. Um, they also are creating an ombudsperson's office um, to work with patients um, to resolve and try to plan in advance for um, resolving um, uh, potential billing problems and came up with a policy for um, catastrophic events so that someone who is in um, an accident, for example, um, doesn't suffer a severe financial hit um, as a result. These changes, I should note, were um, encouraged by a community advisory group that has on it a number of uh, members of the President's Council as well. Um, we've also added to Kevin McDonald's uh, title, he's the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, we've also added community partnerships to his portfolio. So someone at the Vice President level will be helping to organize all this work. Um, so we have been able to make some progress and I'm really pleased by um, what we've been able to do, but all of you know um, that there's plenty more work to do. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful that you're focused on this topic, Ian. I I'm sorry I can't stick around to hear from uh, the panelists, but I know that there are a number of faculty and students and staff from Batten who are already actively working um, in the community. Um, and I applaud those efforts um, and I hope you have uh, a great session. Thanks for letting me um, Zoom bomb you all. Thank you, President Ryan, for your words and your work in this area. Speaking personally as a, a newcomer and relatively new resident, a dean, a neighbor, I appreciate your leadership and the university strategic plan, which recognizes that our success, all of us as a university community depends in no small part on the strength of these communities. Um, the relationship between UVA and the broader Charlottesville community is critical critically and mutually important. So we understand you can't stay, um, but we thank you um, for joining us and on behalf of the Baton community, um, look forward to seeing you around soon. All right, my pleasure. Take care, everyone. Welcome everybody. Um, we have a terrific panel set up today. Um, each of our panelists is active as a good neighbor here in Charlottesville doing different things, some of whom are good neighbors here within the Batten School. I will introduce them very briefly one at a time and then they will tell you a little bit more about their work and then we'll go into some Q and i um, I'm gonna do my best to moderate this. If you want to ask a question, you can use the uh, raise your digital hand 
and then at the appropriate time, I will, I will find you and call on you. First, it's my real pleasure to welcome Michelle Claiborne, Director of Equitable Analysis at UVA's Equity Center that Jim Ryan referred to. Michelle, we are also fortunate, is a lecturer here at the Batten School, so perhaps some of you have had her in the classroom. Michelle, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. I'm really excited to be able to talk about the collaborative work that we've done with Sue Moffitt in the Charlottesville Department of Social Services. Um, I know that I and our students have learned so much through working over several years, analyzing administrative data to better understand if and where patterns of disparate outcomes are arising in our child welfare systems. Um, and so that's been the focus of our work, a series of reports working in collaboration with our local with our local leaders in this space. Um, and I, while I have the floor, I also want to say that I've been grateful that the Batten School has been such a supportive home um, in which to experiment with collaborative community research and to learn to do it better. That's a, that's a real asset and it's not a universal thing at the university, though we hope it will become so. Um, Finally, you know, I joined the Equity Center actually just a year ago, and while the work with Charlottesville's Department of Social Services precedes my formal involvement with the Equity Center, it's very much aligned with the kind of community-engaged scholarship that we want to pursue and promote in the Equity Center. So as our policy-oriented work in our democratization of data initiative starts to ramp up, um, I'm actually really eager to find ways to bring more of our Batten students into the new and ongoing community and equity-oriented equity projects that we've begun. Terrific. Thank you, Michelle. Our next guest to introduce herself is uh, Sue Moffitt, the interim director at the Charlottesville Department of Social Services. A big welcome to you, Sue. Tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation and look forward to hearing the discussion. Uh, we, uh, the Department of Social Services has been working with Michelle and her team for a number of years, as she mentioned, to look at disproportionality in our child welfare caseload. From those uh, two and a half years, two and a half research projects, I would say, because we got a little sidetracked because of COVID, um, we have identified several internal actions to uh, improve the practices in our own organization and also external actions to improve practices in our work with, with the community. Um, we're really looking forward to expanding this research project to include um, data from the Albemarle County Department of Social Services, which should allow us to find some new con conclusions and ask some new questions. And it's been great to work with Michelle and her team. Terrific. Thank you, Sue. Our next panelist is someone who should be well known to all of us, Professor Brian Williams, an Associate Professor of Public Policy here at the Batten School. Good morning and thank you so very much. I'm glad to be here with each of you. Um, I'm Brian Williams and I have an interest in public engagement in reimagining and redesigning policies, practices, structures, and systems that improve relational policing. And I've been really fortunate uh, since I arrived here three years ago to work with some outstanding people, including Ms. Mary Coleman, uh, the Executive Director of the City of Promise, where we collaborated with a couple others to kind of co-create and, and kind of co-produce a uh, a video vignette that really highlights a prelude to an encounter that we have used to unpack uh, some of those implications for improving police community relations. I'm happy to speak more about that, um, but I'm glad to be surrounded by some outstanding neighbors and glad to be in this neighborhood of Charlottesville and UVA. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. And finally, uh, we have Mary Coleman, the executive director of City of Promise here in Charlottesville. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. City of Promise is a place-based initiative in Charlottesville. We serve a specific zone or neighborhood. And to contextualize that for you, if you think of us as serving the neighborhood sort of between the standard student housing apartment and Bodo's, that's pretty much our zone, the Bodo's on Preston, I should say. Uh, that's our zone. And we've been around for about nine years and we've collaborated with UVA in a lot of ways. In addition to most recently with Brian, uh, Madison House volunteers come and provide tutoring for our students. Uh, the UVA health system has provided grants that we've utilized for some health initiatives that our program has done. Um, we've collaborated with Virginia Humanities on the creation of a children's book that's slated to be released in June, which we're excited about. And then I've also, I'm always in discussion with Katie Ryan, most recently around a reading effort. 
and the Equity Center around a Montessori school to be created in our neighborhood. So there's ongoing collaborations with UVA and we're proud of those partnerships. Fantastic, thank you. Um, why don't we start with you, Mary, and maybe Brian wants to chime in as well. With this prelude to an encounter and the work you've done recently together, what was what motivated that work and what does it hope to accomplish? Brian, I'll let you launch that one. One of the things I've always been uh, uh, focused in on is how to be proactive in a coactive way instead of being reactive when we think about relational policing. So uh, with the support of a joint learning agreement from the Kettering Foundation, uh, but also the support of City of Promise, the Charlottesville Police Department and the Charlottesville Police Foundation, what we were able to do is bring together about 12 to 15 kids from City of Promise, uh, that area with two police officers to kind of think about uh, ways to kind of tell their truth, their perspective as it relates to uh, community policing, looking at the obstacles, but also the opportunities. Uh, so we had about seven, eight sessions where we were allowed to uh, kind of form, storm, norm, perform, and ultimately transform. And we co-created and co-produced, well, they co-created and co-produced a three minute video vignette that highlights a prelude to an encounter. And I've been really fortunate to use that uh, for presentations um, at other universities across the US, but also for professional associations within the US um, uh, to kind of really facilitate these kind of courageous conversations to kind of unpack some of those things that are hidden and embedded within that video vignette. But all of that was based upon uh, this notion of being really the good neighbors, where we, where we understood that we shared the same kind of space, place, and time, and uh, uh, we had an opportunity to kind of work together, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think uh, the use of the word opportunity is important as far as that project, because a lot of the children that we work with, you know, live in public housing, and opportunity for them uh, is some, so opportunity sometimes escapes them. You know, children who have higher GPAs and who are more dynamic get the chance to do the really amazing resume building. And so Brian's invitation to us was really um, important because it gave students who might otherwise be on the margins of opportunity and dynamic experiences. It gave them a chance to succeed at something. The, the film they created was, was really uh, compelling. And um, you know, it's something that they can add to their college resume and, and, and help build their confidence and their, and their ability to, to do things that, that maybe they haven't done before. Did it take some time to build that trust, Mary? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because these were children who, as I said, you know, are not necessarily the most outspoken. Um, and they weren't even aware a lot of the tensions around um, policing at that time. So this was pre-George Floyd. Um, so, so, I mean, obviously policing is always in the news, but the, you know, these are middle schoolers and young high schoolers. They're not necessarily attuned to all of that or even the tensions in Charlottesville. So it's very educational in that regard. And the officers were very accommodating and relatable uh, and they had a good time together. Great, thank you. Um, so I understand that Michelle and Sue may have worked, done some work, at least intersected with each other related to the Department of Social Services, looking at racial disproportionality in the child welfare system. Um, Sue, do you wanna tell us about that work? Well, uh, I'll start it off and then let Michelle talk about the details. Uh, we were fortunate to have a professional interaction with uh, some UVA faculty on the Thomas Jefferson Area Coalition for Homeless Board of Directors. And that's really where the initial um, connection was made. And we knew that in, our, in Charlottesville, especially after August of 2017, and really even leading up to that summer, that we had some work to do um, to be able to um, document our outcomes specifically in child welfare but by race. And, uh, but we just didn't have the capacity to do it. And um, that's where we reached out to UVA and Michelle was very gracious and spent a lot of time learning not only about child welfare, we talked to a lot of kids about child welfare, it was a great couple of years, um, but also um, the staff that were working in child welfare, what our qualifications were, what additional training we had besides our ac academic experience. And Michelle, do you wanna talk specifically about the project? Yeah, um, so so it really revolved around you know when when um, 
I was brought together with Sue, right, understanding what they were, what they needed to do, it seemed like a really great opportunity to bring some of the expertise and, and some of the desired learning from UVA around wanting to understand how to use data better and particularly using data in, in the framework of equity and justice. Um, this seemed like a really wonderful combination to meet some, some pedagogical goals, as well as help do some work that, that the Department of Social Services wanted to see. Um, and so, so we actually did a lot of this work through uh, an applied lab, right? So I've had three years of students uh, working on this with us where we you know, gained access to the administrative data um, in Charlottesville. And one of the really key benefits, I think, so here I'm sort of speaking to the students a bit, one of the key benefits of that is, uh, or at least one of my goals for that was really to give students an opportunity to kind of practice using data critically, like questioning the source, the, the, the meaning, the purpose, the power of the data, um, and not just, not just using it, but using it with a lens of understanding their power in relation to the data and how do we make sure we don't do harm with it, how do we how do we analyze it and communicate it in a way that's beneficial to our community broadly, as well as the people that is, are being represented by that data. And so that's been our one of our key underlying goals. And in the process of this, we've generated several reports. Um, they're available on the Charlottesville Department of Social Services website, as well as university libraries uh, institutional repository, um, because we wanted to make sure that they were accessible to the community as well. I think that's another part of the work is um, making it open and available to the larger community. And so, yeah, I maybe, maybe talked a little bit around that, but largely it was around working with data and practicing our developing data skills while doing it in a way that was tried to be very attentive and very steeped in learning um, from, the, from our experts in the community to, to generate uh, a report that could be useful. So Michelle, and your work with Sue, they focus on being useful, right? Sharing, engaging. One of the themes that I've heard that I worry about sometimes is the sense that I've heard this from some of the local community groups, they don't want to be the laboratory experiments for students who are going to come and then go, right? They want a very different types of relationship. Um, one more neighborly, one more engaged, one more about around partnership. How did you navigate that to make sure you were not just you know, doing research that might benefit you or benefit students, but really benefit the community? So, I mean, I think that is a real challenge. And one of the, you know, one of the things that we did, we do in the course and in the lab was we, we do spend a lot of time around what it means to, um, what it means to be in solidarity with the, like, we're not just studying a problem, right? We have to approach that problem of solidarity. It's not their problem. It's not a client's problem. It's not other people's problems, right? These are our problems and, and therefore they're, they're worth our investment and understanding. And so there, there's a certain ethos that we want to kind of develop um, and practice and model and get better at. Um, and so one of the things, you know, it's, it maybe sounds a little silly, but like I, like we shut down, oh, our client's problems. I don't think of Sue as our client. I think of Sue as our partner, right? I don't think of the child welfare system in our community as somebody else's problem. This is our, this is our problem, right? This is our community. These are our children, you know? And, and so there's a lot of, you know, some of the work is really about making sure we keep adjusting how we're talking about it um, because it informs, you know, how we're thinking about it. And so we spend a lot of time on that, and and we spend a lot of time talking with the experts, right? We're here to learn from them. Um, we're not, you know, I've I've learned a great deal about the child welfare system, but Sue is still the expert, um, and so approaching that with humility, right? And we we may have, you know, experience in trying to understand policy and 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 analysis and making recommendations, but we don't necessarily know this domain when we enter. And so spending a great deal of time investing and talking with partners and checking back and forth to make sure our understanding is, um, is reasonably correct. Um, so there's a lot of communication that has to happen as part of that project. It can't, it's not a handoff sort of thing. So Sue or Mary on the other side of that equation on the community side, and though we're trying to say it's not about sides, but Simpsons formally initially your approach from the big bad UVA um, that as much as I think we aspire to make it a 
unfair advantage to live near it. I'm not sure it's always perceived that way by its neighbors. What was your, how did you take that interaction? Sue, start with you. Um, well, I think specifically with this project, uh, it, it is just about data. And we often either as partners or hear from community residents that we're sick of these students coming in, you know, asking us a bunch of questions and turning in their paper and that's that. And we never see the paper. We don't get any information we can use from it. You, the same as you've already said, sir. But um, this data in particularly, because it's just data, it's de-identified caseload data. It's a longitudinal study that we um, have a framework for. We've handed off to the state to say, hey, can we institutionalize this to, to look at us compared to other localities? And it really has been actionable for us as opposed to just the student's perspective. It's really, here's here's what the data shows about the situation and we can all use it in different ways. I think from my side, the model that we use with Brian is really an excellent model for a program because we were able, and the students were able to build a relationship with Brian. And if it weren't for COVID, I, I believe we would have re-upped it. Like we would have done something else. We would have had a follow-up um, and I think that that's the key, you know, the research says it takes two years for youth to build a relationship with someone that's really solid. So if we think of uh, these, these projects as more long term and designed to, to build and sustain a relationship, I think then it doesn't seem as predatory or as opportunistic. Uh, it seems like it's more for the benefit of the whole in, in solidarity and not just for UVA. Is there tension sometimes, and, and Brian, you might have a perspective on this, between getting involved, building that relationship, creating the solidarity that Michelle talked about, while also maintaining some objectivity from a research perspective? Yeah, there is some tension with that. But uh, what I try to do to kind of um, address and resolve that tension is to understand that I'm coming from a particular perspective, but others come from different perspectives too. So it's not about me, it's about us. And I think that's the main thing when we think about being a good neighbor. Um, I try to make sure that I get beyond the walls of Garrett Hall, get beyond the grounds of the University of Virginia and to engage with the community in which I, I, I live and kind of have my being, if you will. Uh, and I think that's important. And I think we have to be mindful and intentional, but we also have to understand there may be some challenges that come with that because traditionally the academic community is one that is very kind of insular. Uh, it has, as an African-American, um, it can be quite, it has a history of being exploitative. Uh, um, so we have to acknowledge those, those uh, challenges of our past, but don't allow them to continue to define our present, but to use that to kind of really plan with the community, um, our neighbors to kind of kind of think about a brighter future in which it's much more equitable, just, and fair. And uh, where we become, uh, like uh, President Ryan says, not just uh, going from great, but also a good uh, institution. And that's the opportunity that we have in spite of those tensions that you, you noted. As you've built these programs, Brian or, or, or Michelle, your work, are there things you've learned about how to set it up with a higher likelihood of success, whether it's just recognizing the, the past whether it's, Michelle, you talked the importance of language and how you call things and because how you speak defines how you might think about it. What are some of the best practices for how a university can be a good neighbor? Start with you, Brian. Just acknowledging our past, I think is really, really important and how it impacts our present, but allow that to kind of plan, uh, you know, in a collaborative way for, for a brighter future for all involved. Uh, one of the things uh, that I wanted to do, and I did personally in, in regarding this effort, was I wanted to make sure that those uh, kids who were involved, uh, that they understood that their minds had a value. So I, I paid them cash. Uh, each session that we attended, we talked about because I wanted to make sure they understand that as you think that, that that's a way to kind of generate some income. But if you get a chance to watch that video uh, vignette, uh, it is powerful, it, but it, it was their co-creation. And uh, from Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School, uh, where I showed it to the Evans School at uh, University of Washington, uh, the Government Finance Officers Association present, presentation, um, 
local alumni chapters of my uh, social fraternity, and they've utilized it. Just recently, the Athens alumni chapter in Athens, Georgia used it to have a discussion. Um, and everyone sends back messages to me of how powerful it, it was in terms of um, you know, the impact, the hidden messages within it. Uh, but there's a way for us to kind of uh, really kind of encourage, nurture and develop those who participate in that process and uh, kind of meet them where they are, but also to uh, kind of propel them a little forward, kind of help nudge them. And I'm hoping that exactly is what happened with this uh, particular process. Great. Michelle, thoughts on that from your end? Yeah, I would, I would hearken back to actually the a ref a reference you alluded to already, Ian, um, about trust is sort of essential to this. And so is I, I kind of begin with the expectation that when we're partnering outside the university, trust has to be built. We shouldn't, we, we can't enter it thinking that that is established already. And I, I really love the um, phrase by Adrian Marie Brown about moving at the speed of trust. And so that's one of the, one of the pieces that I think has to go into a successful uh, implementation of this work is understanding that it might move slow, um, that trust needs to be built, which means we probably need to imagine things as longer than a semester, longer than a year, right? Which is why it's been so gratifying to be able to work um, with Sue for several years. It also means though that, for instance, from a, any individual's perspective and particularly the student perspective, um, they may not always be involved long enough to witness the full outcome of it, right? So there, you know, from reports from three years ago, we're still having conversations um, with, uh, with working groups and the and the Department of Social Services about how to use this work, right? It's still coming to fruition. And so students might not see all that, which means trust really has to be extended in all directions, right? There's there's many pieces of that trust. And so I think that's um that that's really the core for me of how, you know, how we do this well versus less well. I, I love that moving at the speed of trust. Um, Mary, I saw you nodding when Michelle was talking about that and talking about how things may not go as fast as we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think President Ryan's mandate has gone a long way to drive the conversation and for each university department to think about relationship and building of trust. And my, um, my hope is that those folks who come from a place like UVA that is place-based like we are, that, that prides itself in its architecture and, and its history and its people would realize that everybody in Charlottesville who's lived here their whole lives have a sense of place and a sense of self that the school should honor, right? And, and academic institutions tend to think that they are the bastions of progress and you know, they can sort of bowl over histories that they don't know and understand. And so um, I think these collaborations that are described today help to mitigate the possibility of ignoring those realities and the beautiful stories embedded in our community. That's, that's, that's great. Um, wanna alert our audience that we will be moving soon to Q and A. So if you do have a, just think of your questions and if you have one, you can put up your, your digital hand. I want to, before I go to the audience, though, turn it back to our panelists. As we think about being a good neighbor, right? We can think about that in our personal lives, about you know what it means we might do to the person who lives next door. Um, are there some fundamental values that we need to be practicing as an institution? How do we teach neighborliness to these incoming groups of students who come in, or to People like me who come in, get dropped here, living on the lawn, very much can, it's easy to kind of be part of a bubble. Are there, are there ways we can work to make the, the flow from community to university more porous and values we can encourage new people coming in about getting to know the broader community and vice versa, opening this place up to others more effectively? Sue, thoughts on that? You were here as a student and came back as a professional. Oh, excuse me, I, I was, but um, you know, that was a long time ago. And I think the university does do a good job of that or that individual students do a good job of that. I think particularly now, the, uh, 
one thing that I think everybody can agree on about Charlottesville is that we include we encourage citizen activism. So uh, anything that the students can do to learn about that, learn about the roots of it in the community, um, is is important. And I my experience has been that the university has supported that. I think there's more that can be done, but the beginning is certainly there. Brian, thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about it. I think a good neighbor really meets people where they are and not where you would want them to be. So uh, and I think good neighbors too understand um, uh, the humanity of others because they understand their own humanity. And what I mean by humanity is our strengths and our weaknesses. And I was reflecting upon uh, my two most uh, recent moves and I had really good neighbors. And why I consider them really good neighbors is as we were moving in, um, they provided lunch. They didn't know us from Adam or Eve, but they provided lunch for us as we were moving in. That was a gesture that I thought that was really, really uh, powerful. Uh, and uh, so I think that that really, they just met us where we, at our point of need. And I thought that was a, a really good example of being a good neighbor. Great. Michelle? Yeah, uh, I want to reflect on actually a comment Mary made earlier, because I think this is really, it speaks to me in a really relevant way about um, part of, especially for the university, uh, being a good neighbor is is approaching with humility, which, which Batten is part of Batten's values, right, in this, um, and a willingness to share power, right? So we're often part of the conversation because we do have some needed skills or knowledge, but we we can't enter as the expert, right? We we can't do it ourselves, right? We have to make sure we're respecting the expertise and knowledge that everybody's bringing, right? Our community partners, uh, our neighbors are bringing to the table. And I think that's any kind of right good neighbor is like that mutual respect and, and really entering, trying to, not trying, really entering, understanding our limitations and, and why we need the other folks in the room to do this well, right? To kind of help establish that that mutual respect that is necessary to be a good neighbor. Great. Mary, any additions to that? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure if the, if the university requires students to have a history of Charlottesville as part of their orientation, but they certainly should. You know, it's just important to contextualize the place that you've decided to spend two or four years. Uh, and that's the best way to have the highest regard for the people who, who live here all the time and who who were born and raised here is to sort of know the history uh, and the, the, the good, bad, and the ugly history of Charlottesville's relationship with the university. So it's interesting. I completely agree with that, Mary. And I think there are has been lots of discussion recently about how to um, require, incorporate, include, increase the amount of, of comprehensive history that students get when they come here. Certainly within Batten for our orientation programs, we've tried to, to build on that. There's a lot of history here. <laughs> um, and there are many different perspectives on this, but I think it, it is very valuable. But these issues are not unique to UVA and Charlottesville oftentimes. You know, what is it about you know, many cities and their the universities, you know, town gown friction is quite common. Um, is there something about the way we operate that we can do differently? I, I've heard some great ideas here about meet people where they are, not where you want them to be, move at the speed of trust, approach with humility, contextualize the history. You know, can UVA be among the better places that does this with its local community or are there structural issues we need to resolve? You're on my screen, Mary, I'll start with you. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's no reason why UVA uh, shouldn't be at the forefront of this, right? I mean, the founding fathers, you know, were, were part of the formation of this university. You know, UVA should be at the front. And the fact that these issues transcend Charlottesville and UVA is part of the point because wherever your undergraduates and your graduate students and your medical professionals are going to go, they're going to need to understand the people that they're serving in the history of a city. So what a great incubator uh, and object lesson sits right here among us. Terrific, other thoughts on that, Michelle? 
You know, I, I do think it's the, the work that President Ryan spoke of initially is, is really, really valuable to this because part of what, you know, I've been at UVA since 2004 and I think there, you know, a lot of us have been trying to dabble in this work and you kind of feel alone and isolated, but it also means that the work, you know, when you get tired, it's done. Um, I think that the structures in the institutions that President Ryan spoke of about trying to build around, you know, about community partnerships and the community center for, I'm, I'm not going to get the titles right. I'm just going to reference back what he said. Those are all, you know, institutions, right, that, is, that I think will make this work better, right? We all know that we need this kind of structure to help these efforts persist and to help us learn from one another and find one another so we can do better together. Um, so I think I think the advent of, you know, the community advisory committee and the community partnerships, um, adding that to Kevin McDonald's portfolio, I think bringing that in in formalized ways can be transformative. Right, right. I'm going to recognize uh, Professor Craig Volden, who has raised his hand for a question. Uh, yes, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for bringing us together and all of the work that, that you're all doing. This is really amazing. Um, for those of us who haven't done as much as we should uh, or want to get started, community members on the call, students, faculty, and staff, any next steps in particular uh, that come to mind, something concrete that we could start on? Great question, Craig. Thank you. I see Michelle's nodding. Does that mean she has an answer? She thinks it's a great question as I well. I think it's a great question. Um, but, I, but I will speak back to that. I think some of those institutions are helpful. I think reaching out, um, you know, I'm part of the Equity Center now and, and we, and, and beyond me, I think there's a group of wonderful people who have a, a growing network of relationships um, of, of trust and respect, you know, so reaching out to avenues like the Equity Center or to Kevin McDonald's office, right, are good places to start um, because because that is where a lot of action is is currently embodied, right? Not it's not the only place, but I think it's one of it's concentrated places, right? Um, where prior to that, you know, finding the person in the engineering school doing this and the person in education doing this, sort of relied on a lot of personal networks. I think now we have these um, hubs that I would. I would encourage folks who want to you know, want to start engaging in this way or increase their engagement in this way uh, to befriend those those entities. Um, I think I, I know from the Equity Center perspective that that there is a a key goal is to bring more people into this work and support them in doing that. So. I recommend that. And also the Center for Nonprofit Excellence just launched a new website uh, for folks who are interested in volunteerism. I can't think of exactly the name of it. Reimagine you, you reimagine CVA. Yep, okay. that's it. Yep, so that's, a, that's another great place to start. Brian, were you gonna add something there? Yeah, just something brief. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is kind of identify those assets based within the community that I could utilize in terms of developing relationship, trying to, uh, trying to establish relationship. And I actually had a couple of assignments in some of my previous courses where I asked students to create an asset-based community uh, directory uh, that allowed me to kind of get a better sense of Charlottesville, surrounding Albemarle County and this region in terms of potential assets. And I think that's how I first got that connection with City of Promise too, through that, that avenue. Yeah, I'm reflecting a little bit in response to, to uh, Professor Volta's question that, you know, Brian and Michelle, you've taken your academic expertise, whether it's around data and visualization, whether it's on, on you know, working with understanding policing, um, and your engagement actually comes out of your work. Many of us, I know, also do things on the personal level, whether it's, you know, I've been working, doing some volunteer work at the Haven, you know, not part of my day job, but part of kind of just to feel more connected to the community on the personal side of things. Other questions? Thank you very much, Russell Walden, for your question. Well, as we wait for a question, I will ask. So as the, you know, the, the, the student life cycle here is fairly short, right? I mean, particularly if you're a Batten student, it's basically two years. Um, Mary had a great suggestion about creating some more intense understanding of the history in the context, but that time that goes so fast and I don't need to tell the students, so you're all pretty busy for major chunks of it, right? 
I'd be interested to know, you know, are there things we can do to facilitate this? Now, I know that we've done lots of, and thanks to Dean Rockwell, created lots of kind of short-term kind of almost appetizers. Here's a day, whether it's bat and builds, here's a day to get involved. And hopefully some students will be inspired by that and decide to continue that regularly. But other, other best practices you've seen for getting students to really, really invest in a meaningful way over their time here. I'll, I'd like to add, because I'll have to zoom out in just a minute at 1220. I think it, there are opportunities for us to kind of, uh, with those who teach, to incorporate uh, assignments that allow them to develop relationships, to have an understanding with the community in which they will be. Uh, but we have to be intentional and mindful and, and kind of make sure those assignments uh, address those needs. And I think engagement is so, so important when we think about a school of leadership and public policy to really appreciate the community, the public, I think is, is an opportunity that I'm hoping that we will continue to take advantage of. Um, before I head out, because I, I'd like to share something, a closing comment if I can, if I have that liberty. And it's a quote from one of my favorite neighbor role models, Mr. Rogers. He said, all of us at some time or other need help whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each one of us is a giver and a receiver. And I'd like for us to kind of really embrace that, those words of wisdom uh, from uh, my role model of being an outstanding neighbor, Mr. Fred Rogers. Thank you all for allowing me to participate. I have to zoom in for my class that starts. Zoom out to zoom in for my class yeah. starts. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Williams. Each of us is a giver and a receiver. We appreciate that. Let me uh, acknowledge uh, Sophie with a question. And I'll turn to Sarah next. Yeah, uh, thanks Dean Solomon. So kind of to bounce off your question, you kind of beat me to it, but I was gonna ask as a student who, you know, I have a year left here and I know a lot of my colleagues in Baton are really excited about our APP project next year. And a lot of us have already kind of found ways to get involved in Charlottesville but how can we approach both volunteering and maybe doing some sort of a research project and applying the policy and leadership tools that we're learning in Baton uh, to our community in a way that integrates these values? Like, I was just kind of wondering if you guys have any tips on when doing research or getting involved, how to do so in a way that is really respectful of our community and serves and uplifts rather than kind of bulldozes in. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie, it's, it's a great question. Um, so, so for you know, Sue um, and Mary, you, you, may be, you may have heard us talk about, you may have come across students talk about the APP, an applied policy project where students really are, the goal I think is to create a partnership with an entity and help them analyze and solve a policy problem over the course of a year with the base of the final product is a, something that that organization can then use. Um, so that, that, that's the heart of the question. And in terms of designing that, now, of course, sometimes the organization's needs are not exactly what the student's trying to find. And there is, sometimes needs to be some, some wrangling. But you know, can you think of this type of policy questions that the Department of Social Security might need here, um, where you, know, you could identify a question that students could help you solve, primarily with a policy or analytical angle? Well, I, I was just going to say at the Department of Social Services, oftentimes it, uh, we get requests for students for information to answer their questions. And as, as you suggested, if, if we can flip that and we get to say, here's what we'd like to know about, can you help us? Almost like a, a pitch night or, or, or something along those lines. Maybe for the first year, there's a, a way to help students become more involved or aware of the history of Charlottesville. Social determinants of health is a great way to start because we all have connections to those. Um, and then the second year we, we have, and here's what we would, we'd like to know more about, can you help us with it? I agree with that approach because a lot of times these projects can be a, a bit of a, a challenge for small nonprofits in particular to, to manage. So um, if we could lead the way, and you know, determine whether or not we need it and what are the questions that we need answered, that would be ideal. Great. Um, Sarah had a question. Uh, Mike, thank you so much, Dean, for hosting this event. I had a quick question. Um, I didn't hear, maybe I missed it. The work that, in all this work, how, how you're accounting for the refugee population that's come and resettled in Charlottesville. 
uh, how are you supportive of the RSC and in particular of those families who, they, who don't speak English to begin with? Whether they come from Afghanistan or Nepal or any other countries in Africa, because those people don't speak English. So that's a different story. And they, yeah. I'm sorry, who, who's the question addressed to? Anybody in particular? I guess the panelists. Okay. Since we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'll start. So um, we serve the West Haven public housing site, and we have a number of refugee families here. And um, we rely on IRC and international neighbors to really uh, help lead the way in meeting their, their basic needs. And I feel like depending on the language, there are um, translators available local, locally to support them, or we use a language line, uh, which we pay for to help do translation. Um, we have some Burmese families that speak Karini, and evidently there's like nobody anywhere who sleeps who, who speaks Karini. Uh, locally, but I did find somebody that they go to church with who's willing to translate. Um, and they, they do need that support. And it's really hard to make those connections. I just saw a dad uh, at a bus stop this morning and uh, his, his wife had had a, a negative interaction with a dog in the neighborhood. And I asked, how's your family? And he seemed to understand what that was, but then I wanted to tell him about City of Promise and I couldn't, you know? So, so it's a challenge, but it's one that we are committed to addressing and meeting those needs. I would agree with the child welfare research projects. We just don't have enough um, uh, numbers. Our caseload is not that big where we can be sure that if we start looking at outcomes by particular ethnicities that we can also protect that family's confidentiality. So we haven't been able to do it. It is a challenge. Great. Um, thank you, Sarah, for the question. I think we probably have time for one more audience question if there is one or maybe two. Any questions? So I got a, a question in the chat here that's really a, I think a challenge to me a little bit more as much as a question about whether and whether institutionally we incentivize faculty who are on the tenure track and give them credit and actually measure and find some way to account for the work they do in community engaged work. I know this has been an important discussion and, and Michelle's involved with the Equity Center is in some ways designed to create a home for community engaged scholarship so that we can know how to measure and evaluate community engaged scholarship. Um, and certainly within the Batten School, we're or, or kind of a, an unusual school here within the university because we measure not just teaching research and service, we also actually measure engagement and as part of every person's um, annual review as a faculty member. Um, but it is, a, it is an interesting question because I think many schools do not actually have a way of measuring this sort of engagement that we're talking about here today. And I think Batten is trying to lead there and the work of the Equity Center I think is a, it has been quite valuable there as well. Other questions? I see Susan Payne raising a, a real hand. I, really, I don't know how to do anything here, Ian. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I am on the Batten board, and I am here for a couple reasons. Number one, I want to thank you all. I want to thank everyone on this Zoom call for the work they do in our community. Um, I basically I have a communications firm in Charlottesville, and I probably do communications for 30 nonprofits. And the one that I'm doing right now, which I, I, is so dear to me, is a nonprofit called Child Health Partnership, um, which maybe steps a little bit where Mary is. It's looking at the whole family, many refugee families, and what they need when they settle here, especially if they have sick children. But I happen to kind of bounce around UVA and find someone that will help me <laughs> and say, will you help me? And what we need is intellectual um, comments to make our case. And what I would like is if Batten had some, somewhere that people could call and not try to figure it out. Ben Castleman has been wonderful to me when I've been doing work with the community college system to try to get um, and he's been wonderful with facts, and we're now getting the governor to say community college should be free, 
and tell students how much more per hour they can make if they go to community college. Um, and it's working. But that was not a formal channel, Ian. <laughs> Almost, almost is like an intake desk, like a law school yes. kid might have. Is someone you come and they help to figure out where you might be able to get help. I think it's a it's a great idea, and it's actually these days you can imagine a virtual welcome or intake desk. And I bet we have uh, the, the the technical talent, um, an organizational talent on this call to actually put that together as a, as a as a great student project, maybe in collaboration with Madison House as well. Yeah, I think, that, and also in terms of the intellectual horsepower. Um, in terms of governance in the city, I mean, Batten has the best public policy people and departments. And the city is small, it's 50,000 people. Um, they, get, they, get, they run projects for three, four, five years. Um, and I think they do that because they do not have staff to give them information. And that, that is in planning, it's in architecture, it's in social services, it's, it's, it's in policing. Um, and, and I believe that the university is the place with, that likes to share its intellectual capital. I think their mission, as the state has said, as a state institution, that's, what, that's what's important. And right. I just wonder how we can do that better. Um, but I will say all of you on the call, thank you. That's really Ian, what I wanted to, you know, I don't talk that much, right? <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Susan, for being here. Thank you for your work. Some of you know Susan, she's also done a lot of work with the tourism board for, for Charlottesville, bringing more people down here, showing off the many things about this community that I think are benefit to the university and, and for the university to benefit the community. So we appreciate your work. This come, brings us to the end of our Baton Hour time. Um, so please join me in thanking our panelists, Michelle, Sue, and Mary. Um, thank them for their organizations as well and the contributions you make. Um, you know, we look forward to many years of partnership, not just, you know, short and get out, but, but, but a long-term relationship to, to strengthen the work that, that you do. And to students who, who have more questions, want to get involved, please know the school wants you to be engaged. We want you to find ways to make your APPs meaningful, both to you personally, but to the communities we serve. Um, you know, and uh, I think we are all, we all play a role in being and cultivating neighborliness. Um, I think we've heard some great ideas here about trust, about all being givers and receivers. I'm pleased to be part of this Baton community where I know we, we all care and, and, and want to make where we live a place where people thrive, where people are safe, where people's public policy challenges are being solved, where the quality of governance is being improved and where the relationship between town and gown are an asset to all of us and not a liability. So with that, let me wish you all a wonderful week and a wonderful month. Last batting hour of the year until the fall. See you all soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.